groundedness is not about checking out and going to the monastery and retiring and becoming all Zen. It is about taking whatever passion, drive, motivation that you have and making sure that it's channeled in productive, meaningful directions. Very few people burn out when they're working in alignment with their core values. Like I've never met a carpenter or an artist or a sculptor or uh, like a, a surgeon that is actually spending their time in the OR, not doing administrative tasks that burnt out from too much work. People tend to burn out when they have all this energy and they want to engage in meaningful projects, but they get sucked into things that, um, that aren't actually in alignment with their core values, either because some sort of inertia took them there or because it's what they think they should do or kind of like what society says that, that they ought to do. I think that's really important. Yes, groundedness is about contentment, but it's not contentment born from just being. It's actually contentment from doing that is in alignment with your being. A mentor of mine read the book. He's like, this is the yoga of do. <laughs> I like that. That's a great way to put it. The, the misnomer I feel that a lot have is that their work, that which they get paid for, has to check that meaningful box. And that's just not always the case. As much as we would love to fantasize about that, and there's certainly many people online who are living in alignment with that core value in their work. But if you're not, that's okay. Just find other ways to bring your core values into your daily life. I think that's the bigger takeaway. Because so many are like, oh, this is great for you and Johnny. You got a podcast. This is great for you, Brad. You're a writer. Like You're living in your core value. That's awesome. But I got to keep a roof over my head. I have children to support. And I'm not finding that core value exposure in my day-to-day -day job because I may have picked the wrong major. I may have been stuck on this career path. And now all of a sudden, I can't really just jump and change and go towards my passion. So that's why I, I like taking the more holistic view, which you bring about in the book, that this groundedness is not just this idea of like finding your passion and work and then running full blast in that direction. There are actually components to it. And the more you can bring this into your life, cultivate this in your life, the more you'll be like that blow up punching bag that gets punched and then pops right back up, right? You can take the punch, but you'll be there standing no matter what. Yeah. And, and I think you'll also have the confidence to, to job craft. So if you are in a role at work that doesn't feel right, maybe you don't do a wholesale change, but you slightly start to tweak that role or you approach it in a way that does feel a little bit more invigorating, or you gain the confidence to say, Hey, this is a job and that's fine. Like y'all can wax philosophical about mastery and craft, but I'm going to work a nine to five and make decent money. And then the rest of my life, I'm going to build meaning. Uh, which is a really wonderful thing. I admire people that, that can do that. The first principle is to accept where you are to get where you want to go. This is really about seeing situations clearly for what they are. Not what you think they should be, not what you want them to be, not what you wish they were, not what you think other people see, but what's really happening. And so often we wear rose-tinted glasses and we refuse to acknowledge challenging situations. And as a result, we do all this work to make things better, but we're never actually addressing the root cause. So we're just chasing our tails. So the first step of being grounded is to accept reality, whether it's wonderful or really shitty. You don't have to like it, but you have to be able to see clearly and, and accept it for what it is. And there's all sorts of practices in the book for doing this. The one that I find most helpful is what psychologists call self-distancing. Self-distancing is this concept that basically says when you're in the midst of um, a really charged situation, whether it's good or bad, you can merge with that situation. You become it. And once you become it, it gets very hard to step back and see it clearly. You get really sucked into it. So self-distancing is all about creating some distance between what's happening, the situation, and your awareness of it. So the way that I talk about it in the book is it's the difference between being in an action movie and having a front row seat for the action movie. And if you can pull out and take that front row seat, then you can bring a little bit more wisdom to your decisions about what to do next. So the, the three ways that the research shows is most effective to do this. The first is through some kind of meditative or contemplative practice where you have an object to focus like the breath, thoughts come up, you go back to the breath and suddenly you start seeing thoughts and feelings is separate from you, and therefore you have some space to, um, to evaluate them. 
The other ways that uh, are actually a lot simpler, I think, is that you can envision that a close friend is in the exact same challenge that you are, and then ask yourself, what advice would you give to that friend? And then you actually have to do the hard work of following that advice. And then the third way to do it is to imagine yourself older, wiser, maybe 10, 20, even 30 years down the road, looking back on current you. And what advice would older, wiser you give current you? And all these things are, again, I, I, I don't know if listeners can, can or if there's a, a, a visual component, but if not, I'm basically holding my hands together and that's being merged with the situation. And it's really hard to accept and see clearly if you're merged and self-distancing is about creating some space. 